Hello students, this is uh, Dr. Winkler again. I'm recording this for the History 1500 class. This is Ancient Civilizations. And uh, let's see, this is probably about the fifth lecture of this semester. So let me look at a calendar up here and say that this could probably be the first lecture of the week going from the 6th to the 10th of April. And uh, we're still uh, getting into the Middle Ages. At this point, I'm going to start discussing Islam. Now, remember earlier in this class I said that we are supposed to have a, roughly one-third of this course is supposed to be on Asia and Africa, and the remainder the other two-thirds is supposed to be on on Europe. Well, I'm already a little bit beyond the one-third for Asia and Africa when, when we were talking uh, earlier, largely India and China. But at this point, I need to also start discussing Islam. I guess, technically speaking, since Islam starts out as a Middle East religion, and then it does develop later on, and sweep, I should say, sweeps into North Africa. So it's, it's probably part of that one third that should be on Asia and Africa. Well, let's take a look at Islam and look at its importance, what it is, and its importance historically. Terms. I've actually seen this even yet in academic papers, in academic books, where they call the Muslims uh, Mohammedans. Well, Formally speaking, Islam is the name of the religion. And Muslim is a member of the religion, not Mohammedans. Now, this is offensive to many Muslims because in saying that they are Mohammedans, uh, it does imply that they worship Muhammad. In reality, they do not worship Muhammad. They worship Allah, who is the one and true God. Uh, let's take a look at the beginning of the religion right here. Let's take a look at Muhammad. Muhammad is actually the, the leader of the religion. Um, he's unusual to a certain extent because he uh, really starts his life work at a fairly advanced age. He's about oh, 39 or 40 when he starts this religion. This is unusual, particularly because life expectancy was not that long back then. Uh, 35 might have been an average, or thereabouts. Um, in other words, he's already exceeded his life expectancy. And usually people who make their contributions start at an earlier age. Very likely, usually in their 20s. Well, who is this man? He's a trader. He's a merchant. He travels around the Middle East. Should we pull up Islam in the Middle East? Give you an idea where he was from. Uh, he's actually from, well, it's a nice shot of the Middle East. I'd like to see a more of a religious map. But anyway, he's, he's, he's from the Mecca Medina area right in here. He travels this entire area. Is that better? Probably not. He travels this entire area. Of course, the Byzantine Empire controls the Anatolia Peninsula up here. It also controls the eastern side of the Mediterranean and it controls Egypt as well. So there's a lot of Christians here. Even though Christianity had not really gotten along very well with Judaism, there are still a lot of Jews in this area. A lot of Jews particularly in places around Jerusalem. Uh, it is helpful to remember that Muhammad was illiterate. He never learned to read and write. He had an extremely good mind, an extremely good memory. However, in traveling around these areas, he became very familiar with the basic teachings of both Judaism and Christianity. And we see that show up, quite frankly, in a lot of his teachings. We believe he had epilepsy, a kind of epilepsy. 
Uh, enough people in the ancient world had epilepsy. A number of important people, probably Julius Caesar, maybe even Alexander the Great had epilepsy. There's some people actually called it a royal disease or royal malady. Well, uh, people that have it today are really quite uh, in a challenging situation. They can't even drive because they might pass out and get in an accident. However, this time frame, this is not viewed as a dis disability. Quite frankly, it can be viewed as an advantage. Because when he collapses with one of these epileptic fits, he says he sees visions. And the visions later tell him how to outline the faith, tell him how to establish the faith, and tell him the basic teachings of the faith. Going back to Muhammad as being, the, as being uh, someone who knew Christianity, and Judaism very well. Uh, he presents himself as a successor to both Moses and Jesus. Moses being the uh, example of Judaism and Jesus, of course, being the example of Christianity. Um, as we look at the religion, we're going to see that there are Jewish and Christian elements in it. We're all also going to see what I roughly call one upsmanship. Now, as Christians, most of us would realize that there's an issue of one upsmanship as well. Because Jesus comes forward in a culture and religion that's basically Jewish. But he says, I'm coming to add more to the religion. Mohammed comes by and says, I'm adding more to Judaism, and I'm adding more to Jesus. According to Mohammed, both Moses and Jesus are prophets. They're extremely important in the faith. However, Muhammad is the last prophet. He's superior to these other men, and he is. there will never be another prophet after him. Uh, he tells us he had a vision, and uh, he had a vision in which he was taken up to heaven. And he went up to heaven, and who would he meet in heaven but, but Moses and Jesus? Well, I'm glad they're there. And in looking at Moses and Jesus, they have a conversation, which would be fascinating if we could listen in on this. But according to, according to Muhammad, uh, we do not have Moses' account nor Jesus' account. But according to Muhammad, Muhammad explained the true nature of the religion to both Moses and Jesus, who were very grateful to now understand the true nature of the religion. And they now are able to understand better and to be better informed. So they actually show his superiority. Uh, the Kaaba stone is a sacred stone in Mecca. As you all know, the most holy city, the most holy site of Islam is in fact Mecca. We'll talk about that in a couple of other contexts as we go along. Well, um, this is the, the, the building itself. I wonder if we can get a photograph of the stone. Yeah, there's a stone inside of it. And uh, apparently what had happened was this. There was the Bedouins, these, the, these are the Arabs living out in the desert. The Bedouins usually um, have flocks, they're shepherds. It can be very challenging uh, survival because the foliage is not great. But nonetheless, these people are out there in the desert. And of course, you can imagine how fantastic it would be Every time the sun goes down in the desert, in modern society, we have all this light pollution. You go out in the desert, and the canopy of stars can be quite breathtaking. If you ever want to do that, drive out in the West Desert here, or uh, drive up to the top of Timpanogos. Some of the trails up there, I've seen, done both this. And the, pan pan <laughs> and the stars can be absolutely breathtaking. Well, these people get used to the stars. And, of course, they honor the stars. And they, if there were something that fell from the skies, let's say, a stone, a, a meteor, say something fell from the sky, hit the ground, you'd say, oh, this is a gift from the gods, because the gods, the important gods, have a tendency to live in the sky. Uh, this may be the origin of the actual stone itself. Sacred stone in Mecca. Before Muhammad ever came along, this stone was highly regarded. And people came there to honor it. 
uh, the people that time frame believed in a mul multiplicity of gods. And sometimes there were little figures there that were involved. Uh, so they're worshiping the figures, and the figures are essentially little gods that people have made. And uh, when Muhammad starts getting these visions, he's told what to do, he goes to Mecca. And uh, sounds a little bit like Jesus cleansing the temple. Muhammad goes to Mecca, he goes to the Kaaba stone. And he kicks, smashes these images, and says, this is an affront to Allah, there's only one God, and that's Allah. And uh, he is forced to flee. We call this the Hijra. You can see it right here. We call it the Hijra about 622 AD. This is when Muhammad goes, shall we say, fled from Mecca to Medina, a nearby city. The Hijra is usually when the Muslims start counting their calendar. In other words, they start in 622. As you know, Christians start in 1 AD. So uh, there's a difference of over 600 years in, in the calendars. So counting back from the modern calendar, what would that be, 1398 or something? Uh, as a man who very much admires the Middle Ages, be fun if we could actually go to the Middle Ages and be 1398 to just simply look around if for no other reason, be fascinating. Nonetheless, that is their dates. And of course, their date is not the Middle Ages. Well, uh, the Quran. Quran is simple, a, shall we say, it is their sacred book and it's largely simple doctrines. Some people say it's written backwards. How would you, how, what do I mean by that? Usually when you have a book that's important as far as arguments are concerned, you'll start it with the simpler arguments and you go to the larger and shall we say the more complex ones. This is actually reverse. The Quran starts out with some of the more beloved and long orations, if you will, at the very beginning. And then later on, it gets to the ones that are less well received and shorter later on. Remember, Muhammad is not literate. He doesn't write this himself. He dictates this. Because some of these books are long, because some of these books are complex, because some of these books include, shall we say, advanced theology, we can see what kind of a brilliant mind we're dealing with here. Can we say simple doctrines? If we look at both Judaism and Christianity by this time frame, or roughly the 7th century AD, there has been created in both cases a very large literature. And if you try to get a good understanding of Christianity and Judaism, certainly you read the Bible, you read the Hebrew Bible, you need to read the New Testament. But to get a good handle on the interpretation, you do want to read many of the commentaries. I'm not going to say that there are not a lot of commentaries that have been written in the Quran, but I am going to say that the basic teachings of the Quran, at least initially, were found in the Quran, and they're relatively simple. According to the Quran, according to Maha, oh, excuse me, I'm going to say a little bit something else about the Quran. In other words, how we got it. Of course, he dictates this. Muhammad dictates this, scribes write it down. Sometimes he's moving around from various oases to oases. And the men who are writing these scribes, they're writing these things down. Uh, sometimes they're not as careful as should have been with them, with the documents. In other words, some of these end up in the sand, and years later people come by, they're digging around, was Muhammad here, and dig up, you find a, a text or something that now you can incorporate into the Quran. So it does take a little while before all of this is brought together. According to the Quran, there's going to be a day of judgment. In Christianity, there's the same idea. There's going to be a time when the people will be judged. So there's going to be a day of judgment here as well. Um, the damned, in other words, there's an idea of a, an infernal region. The damned will burn. Why burn? Well, it's extremely painful. Everybody knows that. It's one of the more, shall we say, more painful of all deaths. Now, however, looking in cultural context, remember these, this religion largely starts out in the desert. It's very hot. 
Sometimes Bedouin, people who live in the deserts, are very amused by Europeans and other peoples who come and like the desert. These Bedouins don't like the desert. You have to live in the desert. You have to function there. But what they want is oases, cool areas, waters that flow around. So if you're talking about some of your greatest punishments, maybe heat, which of course the Muslims know a great deal about, maybe heat would be a place where you'd suffer. Sometimes the, the Bedouins have actually said one most painful of all deaths is to die of thirst in a hot, in a hot scenario. There's a concept of heaven, the people that are sent to heaven. And heaven is very sensual. In Judaism, heaven is hard to define. In fact, there are some small groups of modern Jews who believe, who believe there might not even be a heaven. Um, can we say it's defined? It's ill-defined. I was in a synagogue once many years ago. Um, and you learn an awful lot from that experience. And one of the speeches was given during the, the meeting was uh, talking about heaven. And the man said, I have been a Jew for decades. I've been a Jew for my entire life. And quite frankly, I don't think I've ever heard a discussion of what heaven is like. So can we say it's largely undefined? I would think, however, that it's quite nice. Uh, Christianity has something fairly similar. Christianity has an idea of you live in heaven. It's very nice and wonderful. And, and uh, depending on which religion you look at, you live within the presence of the Trinity, the presence of Jesus. Of course, that brings you great joy. And of course, heaven is in the sky. The stories about angels flying around with wings or up there playing harps, uh, that's probably, shall we say, uh, ex exaggerated. The point is still very similar, however. In reality, heaven is not well-defined even among Christians. It's a very desirable place to go, but what will it really be like? This is somewhat different in Islam because we read descriptions about heaven. Heaven is very sensual. Oh, my goodness. Once again, going back to the idea of what is better, a desert or an oasis? Well, it's, it's an oasis. It's a cool place, not a hot place. Oh, it's cool and, and you know, you know, shade of palm trees. And, uh, uh, you eat ripe fruit, and you get the you get the uh, company of women and boys. It has been implied that when a Muslim goes to heaven, that in reality there's another creation for them. Uh, not people that lived on this world. There's a creation for them where you have women and boys there for your pleasure. Uh, sometimes the sources will say uh, that uh, you get the uh, company of beautiful women with big brown eyes. and Yeah, there's something a little bit more going on, however. It can be a very sensual place in which physical contact is involved. In trying to understand Islam, I've read a number of biographies of Muhammad. Remember one of these, very good book, by the way, I quite enjoyed it. Uh, the author stood back and he made a little bit of a comment. Yes, I'm understanding Muhammad. Yes, I'm understanding the faith. But he said, when he's starting to discuss the ideas of heaven, he says, I don't know about the truthfulness of all these other issues, but when I die, I want to go to, a, a, shall we say, a Islam heaven where the Muslims go. So it's a good place to be. Um, once again, simple doctrines. There are five basic tenets or five basic teachings of the faith. Uh, one is a statement of faith. Uh, I don't know how many times you have to say it in your life, but I'm sure you Good Muslims will say this many times. There is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is his prophet. Okay. Basic statement of faith. Uh, other religions basically have statements of faith. Uh, the Jews, for example, have a tendency to re re repeat the Shema. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Chad. Which basically translates as, 
Behold, O Israel, your God is one God, or your God is God alone. And uh, yeah, I'm sure every every good Jew knows that by heart. Will they say that? Sure, many times. Sometimes they'll actually repeat that just before they die. Um, in Christianity, well, uh, Christianity doesn't really, depending on which Christian group, group you are talking about, some of them do have a statement of faith. You know, we believe in the whole, Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. These kinds of things. Can we say that even though this usually is formalized under many Christian groups, there is a basic idea that Christians should have a belief that can be stated fairly, fairly often. Okay, prayer. You should pray five times a day. Well, if we were in class... And I'm an old sadist. I like to, I'm not doing this just to be mean, but I do this because uh, I think asking a question where I ask my students to think, then in reality, uh, they'll engage a little bit more. So this is a question I like to ask. Okay. Um, <clears throat> those of you who are Christians in class, how many times do you pray on a formal nature? Now, you all know that you should also have a prayer in your heart. You should pray over every meal. But a formal time of prayer, there are twice, right? When you get up in the morning, when you go to bed at night. So there's two prayers. Um, not say you happen to, and I wouldn't expect as many of you to know much about Judaism. But Judaism prays, Judaism actually prays three times a day, formally. And you get up in the morning, you go to bed at night, but there's one in the afternoon. We pray as well. So you have two prayers in Christianity, three prayers in Judaism. Let's do the math. Three and two make five. So you end up with five days of five times of prayer, formal times of prayer in Islam. Um, in fundamentalist groups, people who follow faith carefully, they do take this very seriously. I was talking to a Muslim who took on my classes years ago, and he happened to be from Pakistan. He liked me because I said Pakistan, which is, he, according to him, is a better pronunciation. Anyway, Pakistan. And um, anyway, I asked him about this. He said, he said these are rote prayers. <clears throat> you memorize them. You're supposed to know them. I said, how long does it take to pray each time you pray? He says, about 20 minutes. Hmm. 20 times 5, that's a, that's a pretty good length of, length of prayer. And uh, of course, you all know that when you pray, you should face Mecca. Uh, I don't know what direction you're sitting in as you watch this. But I would think from Utah, perhaps facing Mecca would be facing east. In my case, it would be over in that direction. Um, I was talking to a young lady who had been to Egypt. Uh, and um, apparently, and I think I've heard this in other places, when you sell something, that is an opportunity to negotiate. You, you talk back and forth. Anyway, she's there. I think she said she was buying some cloth. And the man is just about ready to make a deal. Obviously, he's not going to sell her the cloth unless he can make some money. And bingo. The imam calling from the minaret calls out, it's time to pray. Discussion over. He didn't even go to get his mat. Maybe he did have a mat there. He dropped, literally dropped down behind the counter. And now you're going to have to wait until he's done with his prayers before you can continue with the discussion. So this is taken quite, quite seriously. Fast and pray at Ramadan. Uh, there's a month in, in the Muslim calendar. And uh, interestingly enough, because their calendar is not the same thing we're under, uh, we're under the Gregorian calendar, as you know, it's 365 and a quarter days per year. But a lot of times, this is true of the Jewish calendar as well, they are actually functioning on a monthly calendar. And there's only 28 days in the time when the month goes around the earth. So it doesn't end up being exactly 365 and a quarter like you and I are familiar with. It ends up being a different length. So the actual time of months can vary according to the time of year. 
Ramadan doesn't always have to come in the winter time, but it very often does. I think that's a certain advantage because fasting pray at Ramadan actually means that you do not eat during the daytime. However, when the sun goes down and you're pretty hungry, by darn you're hungry, um, and you're hungry and they tend to well, party a little bit, can we say go from a fast to a pretty nice meal, maybe even a banquet on occasion. Um, years ago, I, I can't remember reading if you were if you could not drink water, or you could drink water, I didn't know. And I finally asked a Muslim, and he says, you can't drink water. I don't know if that's common, but I think that it could be very common. Now, I would call it very, very challenging. My goodness, go all day without a drink of water. Hopefully, before the sun came up at Ramadan, during the month of Ramadan, you took a pretty good swig of water, it might hold you a few hours. Um, but this could be challenging, particularly for those who have health problems. That leads me to another discussion here, or observation. Allah is a God of mercy. Allah understands if you are ill, you don't have to fast. Allah also understands if you're a woman carrying a child, you're a woman nursing, or you are a man on campaign, particularly in a jihad, to support the faith. That you do not need to fast because you need them. You need the food. You need more calories to get by. Allah understands. On the other hand, if you can fast, you should fast. Uh, the pilgrimage. So we go back to the, the Kaaba stone. Whoa, I must have got rid of it. Okay, let's go back to the Kaaba, which, as you know, is in Mecca, the holiest city. And one time in your life, at least once, and if you're affluent and you have the inclination, uh, sometimes people will do this more than once, but at least once in your life, you should go to, on a pilgrimage, this is the Hajj, to Mecca. And uh, I don't know logistically how well they do this, because there are hundreds of millions of Muslims in the world at any given time. Even if you only go once, you can imagine the number of people in Mecca, the number of people on the Hajj any given time would be absolutely huge. And you don't just come and walk around, look and leave. You're supposed to go around, I forget how many times you walk around the building, you say certain prayers as part of this pilgrimage. <clears throat> now, my understanding is this about, about the Hajj, and that is if you're going to do this once in your lifetime, and you, and, or twice, or but any event, you don't want to just come in, get off your off the 747, get off the airport, take the cab over, do your, do it, and then come back. No, no, no. You want to spend a while, spend a few weeks. Very commonly, this is a, is this a, somewhat of a, of a vacation. Uh, you get your hotel room and you get on tours, primarily bus tours, and you have your very well informed tour guide, and you're driven around, and you are shown. Notice the people are bowing in front of the stone. And you are driven to various sites associated with the Prophet. Of course, you're going to take the, you're at Mecca, but certainly you're going to take the bus up to Medina. And there's various areas located with the Prophet and his experiences here. Now, once again, Allah is a merciful God, and Allah understands certain things, one of which is that if you absolutely are living in poverty, you really cannot afford to do this, but your heart is in the right place, Allah understands if you absolutely cannot do it. But in reality, if you can, you certainly should. Let's go over to giving alms to the poor, the fifth tenet. Uh, this, is, this is quite interesting. The... Uh, uh, we have a number of religions, Christianity is a good example, that believes in giving alms to the poor. Can we say that there's an, uh, at various times that you uh, that uh, people overlook this? Um, 
you're going to learn more about me when we get to medieval architecture, because my goodness, I love medieval churches. I love the Gothic. I love the Romanesque. And uh, anytime I'm around buildings, either in Europe or building that style in the United States, I do try to make it a very high priority to visit these churches because I absolutely adore them. Well, as a matter of interest, uh, I've watched there a few times. Now, sometimes people that are, we call them panhandlers, people that are poor, the people that are down on their luck, um, will stand by the churches and sometimes have, have very good uh, cases to make. Sometimes they'll pictures, it's my family, and we're hungry, we're starving. Um, sometimes they'll say, my, 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 my people are, are in another uh, country and they can't get out. Therefore, I need your help. And, you know, I'm outside admiring the architecture, but also seeing what happens. It surprises me on a number of occasions how often people will walk by going in, probably like me to admire the architecture, probably very often also to uh, worship. And they'll walk by these people. Um, somehow, in many Western societies, it is at least slightly disreputable to get anything unless you work for it. Does that mean you can't be down your luck? You can be, but a lot of times people say, yeah, you should have planted better, and therefore I'm not going to give you anything. Now, in Islam, you don't do this. In law, Islam, you take this very seriously. Now, I'm not never, ever going to say there's a Muslim who's, who's walked by a panhandler, but I am going to say that there are many people in poorer countries in, in the Middle East and Africa that do make their living virtually on handouts. They simply have not found a way of making a living. I think that would be very challenging in many other societies, but in Muslim states, though I do believe it's very challenging there as well, that can be done. They do take it seriously. Well, some other things we tend to associate with faith, and that is no alcohol or pork. Um, don't go to a Muslim country, walk into the hotel and say, I want to go to the bar and have a beer. Don't do that. They don't drink alcohol. Uh, pork. This is somewhat similar to Jewish dietary restrictions. The Jews don't eat pork, among other things, as you well know. Well, pork. Um, the reason might be very similar to why Jews initially probably didn't start eating pork or discontinued eating pork because you're in a Middle East area, it's quite hot. And pork can go bad very rapidly. Um, <clears throat> there is a double standard, shall we say, virtually in every society. In many societies, if uh, men and women are involved in hanky-panky, well, unmarried hanky-panky, uh, the men are saying, ah, he's a cool guy, right? He's bon vivant. And the women are they're kind of you know, not such so nice people to do this kind of thing. Well, according to Islam, it's not just women who are condemned for this; that men are condemned for this as well. Uh, to a certain extent, therefore, can we say Islam is a little bit more egalitarian? Yes, we can. But uh, by Western standards, women in Muslim countries are treated very, very badly indeed. Um, Polygamy is something that is accepted within the Muslim faith. I'm trying to remember what the Quran actually says about that. I think that the Quran says sometimes you can take two, three, or four wives. And we do have an idea that Muhammad had more than one wife. Though his first wife was a rich widow, um, which of course would help him, <laughs> the financial aspect would help him quite a bit. Well, uh, some would say some, sometimes many wives would actually uh, be possible. Um, we call them harim or harems. Uh, the Turkey sultans, which are Muslims, were famous for this. Their harems could be huge. There are sometimes these harems are so large that if the husband kept company with a wife per night, it would take more than a year for them to spend one night with each wife. Uh, we hear about Muslims actually over, over harems, harems, when the um, Muslims were controlling 
Spain. I'll talk more about that in just a little while. No infanticide. We've mentioned a little bit about population control. Remember I mentioned the Greeks? Sometimes they expose a child. The Spartans would destroy the child, actually kill it. Exposure means you leave the child out, and the child somebody might come by and save the child. More often than not, it does die. Well, you kill children. And killing a girl is probably more advantageous than killing a boy. Because if you kill a boy, well, you just wiped out a boy. If you kill a girl, not only you killed that girl, but you killed any offspring that that girl could have. So as a means of population control, the Bedouins, the people before they joined the faith, would expose or very often bury a little girl baby alive. But the Quran doesn't like that. No infanticide. Now, you can realize what the problem would be. If you're using infanticide killing infants to control a population and you no longer kill the infants, then these checks are no longer there and your population can grow very rapidly. When you have that situation, you have these people live in poverty, and that can be a real problem. But obviously, there's something else you can do with particularly the men. And we call this the jihad. Jihad is holy war, as you know, and it is called the sixth tenet. It is often taught so frequently among Muslim circles that they're actually saying that it's virtually as, almost as important, shall we say, as the basic five tenets. Depending on which aspect of Islam you're willing to look at, some Muslims think that you are chosen for salvation by Allah. And if you're chosen, you're saved. And if you're not, well, you're not saved. Other groups say that while Allah is merciful and can choose you for salvation, by very carefully following the tenets of the faith, following the religion, you can achieve salvation. However, it is widely believed that the only way to actually be sure of your salvation is to die fighting for Allah, to die spreading the faith. Now, according to the basic doctrine, a jihad can only be called in for a place where the religion cannot be preached. One of the reasons why we find Muslims into the jihad attacking Christian areas is that Christianity does not allow this kind of thing, that does not allow the preaching of the faith. So we can say, by their own definition, this kind of thing is justified. You can fight those people. Therefore, you can spread the faith by war. However, if you can preach the faith, you should not be able to spread it by war. We see this, of course, there's some issues of people living in the Middle East, don't like the great Satan in the United States, don't like Western countries, other European countries as well. And every now and again you hear that some important religious leader will say, oh, we're calling a jihad against the great Satan. Well, can you preach Islam in the United States? Of course you can. And there are people that are converted to Islam all the time. On the basis of this, can we say, if you're calling a jihad against the United States, it doesn't fit within your own definition. Salvation is short if you die at war. Of course this means in conquest you're going to kill your opposition. If anybody resists you, they will die. Can we say by extension, you die at war and killing, killing is okay. We rarely see this in other religions where you can actually gain salvation by going to war or gain salvation by killing, by making war, or by dying in a campaign. During the Middle Ages, the popes on occasion would call crusades. It does vary from time to time, but usually it was this. The pope gave a full indulgence, a full forgiveness of the consequences of sin if you will serve for 40 days as a military leader against someone, and, it, and sometimes it was Muslims, against some people that the Pope thinks needs to be punished. Um, can we say these are 
are not always, they're infrequent. They do happen. Uh, so it's not exactly entirely foreign to other Christians, excuse me, to other religions, in this case Christianity, but can we say that it is unusual? This is nothing that's just hypothetical. Uh, you see, there's always the, always the deal where you could very easily have some modes of conquest up here, where you can actually have something that is in theory but not in practice. Okay. Um, this is practiced, and it's not just practiced after the time of Muhammad. It's actually practiced by Muhammad. Remember, he's thrown out of Mecca. He goes to Medina, and he begins to spread the faith literally by the sword. I'd like to show you a map. During the lifetime of Muhammad, these are basically the areas that were controlled by the Muslims at his passing, at his death. It does include Mecca and Medina because he later came back in triumph, though he was forced to leave earlier on. What do we read about this? Uh, there are caravans, as you well know, there's trade going back and forth across the desert here. Not too much directly across the desert. This is a pretty severe place, but usually following trade routes along the coastline. And Muhammad would get his followers literally come riding down on these people. And of course, these people are concerned because a lot of times when you're carrying goods and services that are valuable, people are willing to take them from you. So they expect to be robbed and they maybe expect to be killed. So Muhammad leads raids on caravans and he goes in and much of these people surprise. Uh, Muhammad is not inclined to steal their food or steal their goods. And uh, they're using this opportunity, shall we say, to spread teachings of the faith. Now, normally we would not think, would we, that uh, literally taking a sword and putting it to some guy's throat or a spear and putting it in his stomach, saying, oh, by the way, would you like to hear more about the faith? We usually would think that wouldn't be very successful. Because in reality, once the sword or, or spear has been removed, you know, you're back the way you were before. I'm not under threat right now. Maybe these people were impressed by the fact they were spared. Maybe they're impressed by the fact that they weren't always robbed. And uh, began to think, well, maybe there's something to this faith. As odd as it seems to us, this apparently did work. And we see a very rapid expansion in geographical terms of Islam after the death of Muhammad. But he mentioned this, so let me repeat myself. Jihad only valid where faith cannot be preached. Let's talk a little bit about the conquests. Scoot over here. Unprovoked attacks, yes. There was, whoa, there goes my mouse, which is on the floor. And let's hope it's not broken. Because if it is, I'm going to be in an awkward situation. Let's see if it works. It's working. Okay, I'll break it next time. Never give up trying. Okay, unprovoked attacks on the Middle East. The Persians, well, where the Persians live. The Persians live up in this area. Uh, North Africa. Now, remember, the Christians are controlling this area. Actually, even though this part of the Byzantine Empire, Christianity had pretty well dominated all of this as well way over to here. Go back to my point before I drop my mouse, and that is that these are unprovoked attacks. There was never a time when the, when the uh, Christians came out and said, let's go find those people out at Mecca and Medina and let's take them down. No, it was reverse. So we see starting about, I have the year here, 634 AD. Um, Usually, we count this off by decades. Let me see if I can get a better map. 
it might be a better map, but in reality, it's a uh, not a very big map. Yeah. This works fairly well, doesn't it? These are the errors taken by Muhammad. And let me look at our little schema over here. These are by Muhammad, about 10-year period. Maybe you can see this, maybe you cannot, but it says 622 to 632. The next time frame is 632 to 661, 30 years, roughly, where the Muslims work out in this direction. And then the last group, 650, that's a century, 651 to 750, it goes out in various areas. Why would these people coming in off the desert be able to take down a large section of the Byzantine Empire and a large section of the Persian Empire? Timing is extremely important. We need, to, we need to understand this. You see, the Byzantines don't get along with the Persians. They've been fighting wars and wars. In fact, they've been fighting so many wars that both sides are virtually exhausted. Neither side had won, but they really have expended virtually a very big part of their military prowess. So really, in a 30-year period, look at the extent of this. With almost ridiculous ease, the Muslims are able to overwhelm big sections of the Byzantine Empire, and not all, but a very large section of the Persian Empire. Okay. Very successful, yes. Let's look at what happens to Christianity. The most important Christian centers taken. Now, Jerusalem, as you know, that's right here, as we all know. Jerusalem is extremely important because that is the main city where the temple was. That is where Christianity really got its start, was in the Jerusalem area. Jesus actually preached in Jerusalem. He was killed outside the walls of Jerusalem. It's a holy site. It was taken. Antioch, city up the coastline, about right there, was taken, as you can see, just a few years later. Alexandria, another very important Christian center, which is right down there. We keep on going. Constantinople held out, as you can see, until 1453. A series of attacks, wars going on for centuries, seven, eight hundred years. The Muslims are fighting against the Christians, pushing them back. Finally, the, about the only thing the Christians still control over here is, in fact, Constantinople right there, which you and I remember as being Istanbul. It, the name was changed once the Muslims took it. Well, all these cities that were taken, the Muslims still control them. The Christians have never been able to take them back. Well, during the Crusades, they grabbed them for a little while, but in no real sense were they ever able, able to hold them. Now, these are four areas which the Christians, which were taken from the Christians. However, Rome is about the only one that I haven't mentioned on this, important Christian centers. As you know, Rome is over here. After the Muslims took these vast areas here, they, the Saracens, a Muslim group, were raiding into Sicily and southern Italy. In fact, they occupy southern Sicily for a long, lengthy period of time. But as you can see, in, four, in 846 AD, the Muslims took and sacked Rome. Now, they're unable to keep it. But can we say each major city of Christianity was taken by the Muslims, and they still hold four of them? Only, only Rome was able to hold itself out. Well, for a very lengthy period of time, the Muslims have been attacking Christianity. About the only time when we say that Christianity is able to hold their own, or shall we say go on the counteroffensive, was during the Crusades. Now, yes, the Christians did take Sicily back after a while. The Crusades were were terrible failures, some minor success. For a few decades, there's some small areas here, I should say over a century, but uh, some small areas here were actually held by the Christians. Some people say this is a great crime. 
some Muslims say, look at these terrible, terrible Christians. Look what they did during the Crusades. Well, Crusades are embarrassing for Christianity for a number of reasons, one of which is brutality. But on the other hand, compared if you're comparing, comparing the Crusades with what the Muslims did, my goodness, this is really quite remarkable. Let's take a look at Muslim Spain. Okay. Spain, ardently Catholic, very Christian. In 711, the Muslims crossed over, let's go back to my map, crossed over and attacked, attacked Spain with almost ridiculous ease. They conquered the entirety of Spain. Um, Spain did not lose its Christian identity, though it became quite challenging for many of the Christians to survive under times of persecution. We'll come back to that in a little bit. But even at this, the, the Muslims, though they took Spain, they pushed deep into France. So you can get a map for that. What I really want is to show you how far they got. See if I can find a map for you. And now we have Muslims in modern Spain, in modern France. Let's try map. So I can give you a little bit more detail. Where are we at? Uh, any of it. They take all of Spain. The Muslims take all of Spain and make serious inroads into France. In fact, let's see if I can see what I'm looking at here. The Battle of Tours, we can see it right here. Charles Martel, a Frankish king, he's a Merovingian king in, in France, actually met the Muslims in a very hard-fought battle, was actually able to turn them back. Now, it takes a number of years to drive these people out, a few decades, to drive them back into Spain. But you can see how far they went, how far the Muslims went in to try to control Christian areas. One thing that's not on this map, remember I said that the Muslims took and sacked Rome, uh, but there are incursions deep into Europe. In fact, I find this absolutely remarkable. There were Saracens, these Muslim armies, that went up over the Alps, which is very hard to pass, and they are attacking monasteries up here in what we would now call modern-day Switzerland. So the extent of the invasions are really quite remarkable. Look at the Siege of Vienna. Well, once again, I need a map. And let's take a look. Well, is that helpful? I've already pointed out that hmm. okay, I pointed out that the Muslims went deep into here. Well, centuries later, this is 17th century. Um, actually, starting in the 14th century, the Muslim Turks crossed over here and conquered the Balkans all the way up here. Uh, as you can see, the Turkish extension ex holdings was extensive. In, in fact, they're going to hold this, not all this by any means, uh, in the Balkans till virtually the 20th century. And uh, they're not really kicked out of these areas until 1918, at, I should say the areas over here in 1918 at the end of the First World War. So they hold on this for a very lengthy period of time. In 1683, uh, well actually it was twice, in 1529 and 1683, Turkish armies, Muslim armies came and besieged Vienna and tried to take it. In both cases they failed. The siege of 1683 was remarkable because there's maybe 40,000 Christians there 
and 200,000 Muslims. And very surprisingly, the Christians were able to hold out. And after that, they actually went on the offensive. But if we look at these two maps, as we can get them together here, we have the Muslims going into here, and we have the Muslims going into here. Can we say these are extensive attempts to dominate Christianity? Yes, we can certainly say that. Okay. The Byzantine Empire essentially said Christianity. While the armies, the Muslim armies, go back to a map. Well, the let's get another map. While the Muslim armies go in various directions, you can see. The real prize, if you will, is this. The most wealthy city in the Mediterranean area, the biggest city, the highest prize is right here at Constantinople. So the Muslim armies were very desirous to take this out if they possibly can. So armies that could have been used to sweep through Italy, that could have been used to sweep deeper into Europe, were actually thrown upon the Byzantine Empire. In all likelihood, had not the Byzantine Empire been able to hold out. Remember, they're going to hold out for virtually 100 years uh, before they're finally taken and overwhelmed. That this might have saved Christianity. Because in the early Middle Ages, Christ the Europe is not united. Their military prowess is, so we say, somewhat limited. And uh, sustained attack by the Muslims probably would have led to a failure, a big failure. However, by the time we get to the end of the Middle Ages, when Europe is stronger, as far as population is concerned, it's also stronger as far as military prowess is concerned, their ability to fight. In, in reality, they are able to now hold, hold off the attack of the Muslims. <clears throat> Sometimes when we talk about Islam, we talk about it being a tolerant religion. Well, it, in comparison to some other religions at various times, it does have more toleration. For example, during the Middle Ages, in this area, there are still Jews, and a few Christians have, we'll talk about the dis disappearance of Christianity in this area as well. There's still a few Christians, a few Jews that still live here. They have not been expelled. And we find even Islamic intellectuals, Christian intellectuals, Jewish intellectuals, engaging in discussions, usually by writing to each other, on various aspects of religion. This probably would not, certainly would not have been allowed in Europe because the Christians were not into broad discussions. In this case, we can say that the Muslims were more tolerant. Yes, they were. As we take a, a look at them, can we say that they do not forcibly, for, forcibly, they don't force all of the Christians in Spain to become Muslims. No, they don't, but they don't make it very pleasant to be Christians. However, we do, he, we do see there are forced conversions in Persia. When the Muslims took this area, this is Persia, as you know. This is Persia, as you know, which you now call Iran. Uh, this is not a time we just simply preach the faith. These are forced conversions. Uh, we're actually forcing people to make sure that they accept Islam. It takes a while. This can be done. It takes a while. And of course, nowadays, even nowadays, of course, Iran is a very prominent Islamic state. But it's somewhat different. The Muslims down here are very, very concerned about representing either humans or animals in art. The reason for that is they don't want to go back to animal worship. So if you don't have these things represented, you can't worship them. So in Islamic art, you do not see this down here. However, in art up here in the Islamic art in Persia, you do see representation of human forms. And you also see representation of animals in art. So there are some differences. Um, there are more than one ways of looking at the various aspects of Islam. The largest groups, we, and sometimes we say we put these in two groups. One is the Shiites and the Sunnis. While about 10% of all of the Muslims are Shiites, 
about 90% of the Muslims in Iran are Shiites. Um, the, and the Sunnis are largely everybody else, about 10% Shiite and about 90% Sunni. Um, these, these people do not get along. Uh, the various nationalities, the Syrians, and the Turks, other people fight each other. The Kurds are fighting various peoples. I'm not going to say they always get along, but part of the reason why we have these major divisions is because of the different ways in which the Persians were conquered. Invasion of Spain, easy conquest, I already mentioned that. Uh, it's interesting if we want to look at medieval Europe. Medieval Europe to me is fascinating. But if you want to oversimplify the history of Spain in the Middle Ages, you could actually take it down to one word. Reconquista. Simply means the reconquest. There are other things going on. Can you go to medieval Spain? So we get a map here for you. that doesn't work, I'm going to have to go to the Reconquest. Yeah, I need my map again. Okay. This is perhaps more complicated than it needs to be. We have Castile, we have Aragon, two Christian areas. Um, essentially during the Conquest, yeah, it's too complicated. Let me not confuse you. The initial conquest, we see that they that the Muslims take virtually everything. However, there's these areas up here. These are mountains, as you know. This is this is what a country. And the cavalry tactics that, that the Muslims were using very effectively in other places don't work as well. So yes, they control virtually all of Spain, but there's a small area up here. And over centuries, the Christians, numerous wars, treaties and problems, push the Muslims back. Until finally, the last Muslims have an enclave down here called Granada. And in 1492, see the date right here, the 1492 is when the last kingdom, the last Muslim kingdom that is actually overthrown by the Christians. Now, as Americans, we remember this fairly well. And that is because 1492 was when Columbus sailed the ocean blue. And one of the reasons why Columbus got money to sell uh, these three vessels to have his wild schemes by thinking he can get east by going west. And uh, that is because in January, the wars with the Moors, we call the, the uh, Muslims in Spain Moors, when they are defeated, then there's the king, queen of Spain, Fernand and Isabella, have money left over that they can gamble, if you will, on the on this uh, voyage. So that's a very lengthy period of time. I've already mentioned this. I'm repeating myself. Uh, remember I was showing you about the uh, invasions here. Charles Martel defeated the Moors at the Battle of Tours. Sometimes modern historians want to call it Poitiers in France in 732. That's a major defeat for the Moors, and the Christians began to push them back after that. <clears throat> uh, the Muslims take, take Sicily, take southern Italy, the Balkans, I've already mentioned all this, and these two major sieges of Vienna. Now, let's... so. Let's look at some of the other aspects of the uh, of the impact of Islam on the Christian West, on Christianity, on European history, on Mediterranean history. 
what happens to Rome? We talked about the fall of Rome, remember, in a political sense. Does that mean everything's gone in Rome? Probably not. Uh, they're still trading, yes. Uh, there are churches trying to buoy up institutions, trying to act like Rome and never fall. Trade, commerce, uh, there's intellectuals that are still around, uh, largely uh, producing materials in Latin, very much like the Romans had done. Um, <clears throat> But after time, this is lost. Um, did the Muslims destroy Mediterranean civilization? Was it the conquest of the Muslims that actually changed Roman civilization and forced the, forced the retreat of civilization from the Mediterranean into Central and Western Europe? Well, this became very controversial. This is a fun aspect of historiography. Historiography, the study of history. What are historians thinking about themselves? And uh, Henri Perrin. Henri Perrin was a Belgian. And he wrote several books, uh, very fun books. And you can see that he was working on a book. He dies about 17, 1935. He dies 1937. He didn't complete this book, but we have a very extensive outline. Rather than having a pretty heavy book with you know, hundreds of pages, it's actually a fairly simple book, a couple hundred pages. And rather than having his entire arguments uh, explained, he has essentially blurbs. It's easy. It's an easy read. I think he's making his point quite well. And this is his basic theory that Muhammad, the Muslims, destroyed Christian civilization in the Mediterranean. And civilization goes to Western Europe. Hmm. Now, this was very controversial. This, this, this was a big deal among historians, particularly medievalists. It splashes around. People talk about this. They debate for and, for, for and against it. And uh, over time, the arguments have a tendency uh, to win out. In other words, they're, they're making a better case that in Mohammed and Charlemagne, that in fact it was the Muslims who destroyed the Mediterranean Basin. Let's look at the arguments, basically. The idea was that when you get in the early Middle Ages, like Charlemagne, who is the grandson of Charles Martel, so it's a little bit later time frame, and we'll talk about Charlemagne later when we talk about the importance of medieval civilization. But it becomes more Western and less Mediterranean. How does Henri Perrin know this? One of the ways he knows this is that people in Charlemagne's time quit writing with papyrus. Papyrus, as you know, is a form of paper that is developed in Egypt. So there has to be trade between Egypt and Central and Western Europe in order to get papyrus. At this time frame, however, people in Charlemagne was really what you and I would largely call France up here. They start writing with uh, vellum, and uh, this is calf skin. Uh, it's, it's quite expensive, actually. You have to take a calf, and, and sometimes a newborn calf is the best, or even the fetus of an unborn calf. And uh, you take it, and you treat it, and you, and you stretch it out, and then you write on that. Uh, something that's a little bit less expensive is parchment that's not quite as quite as uh, well treated. Now, obviously, a calf skin or or, or, or a, a sheep skin, those kind of things can have a lot of durability, but they are very expensive. Why would you shift away from using papyrus? It's much cheaper, much easier to use, unless you had to. Another issue is gold. The idea was it's that there was trade going on a medium of exchange in the Mediterranean. And then after the conquest of Islam, then the there is no longer this traffic in gold. So he says he can document uh, the loss of papyrus and loss of gold. These are powerful arguments. Now, for a few decades after Perrin, Perrin, Perrin uh, published this, we have historians lining up. Now, I'm a different generation. By the time I was studying the Middle Ages in graduate school in the 1970s, 
and early 80s actually. Um, we can say it's on the back burner. People saying, yeah, well, there was a decline, but the de de decline had been going on for a long time. Uh, was this really a major statement? And that's kind of where I was coming from. Um, I remember I had, had a discussion with this with an old professor, a lot older than I was at the time. And he says, well, everybody believes the parenthesis. I says, well, in your generation, that's true. In my generation, we're, we're thinking a little bit differently. Let's revisit this argument, however. And I want to argue that I am the one that's now out of step. It's people in my generation that are behind the times. Um, there's a number of books on this. Uh, I wanted to make sure I was up to date, so I read Emmett Scott's Mohammed and Charlemagne, Charlemagne Revisited. And uh, he says it was the Muslims actually destroyed medieval civilization. This is back to Paren's idea. And his arguments are a little bit stronger than the ones I had read before. You see, when the Muslims came in and took various area, uh, they would simply destroy places where crops were grown. Uh, we had to have a support system for crops. Cities have to have a place where they can get their grain and get their food. And when the Muslims come in, they no longer allow grain to be grown in a lot of these areas. In fact, they turn their animals, they turn their sheep and their goats and their cattle to graze on these fields. When you do that, the support structure for the cities actually disappears. So the Mediterranean cities, virtually all of them go into decline. Rome, for example, large population. During the Roman Empire, hundreds of thousands, maybe even a million people live there. And later on, what do you see? By the time you're in the Middle Ages, my goodness, they're actually farming in the bottom of the Colosseum not really realizing why the crops go so well down there, uh, probably fertilized from the bodies of dead animals. A lot of the streets of Rome are vacant. There's simply not enough commerce, there's not enough trade. The reason why Rome probably exists at all is because the head of the church is there. Of course, tithes and trade, people coming in to see the holy sites are going to bring money with them. But it's, it's a shadow of itself. Virtually by the end of, of the, this time frame, urban life had really disappeared in the Mediterranean. And uh, the cities, if we want to call them that, places like Paris and London, that had been established during the Roman time frames, they're, they're villages, they're, they're, they're small towns by this time frame. You see, when the cities go, with the commerce and the intellectual um, propensities, activities go on there, you're losing civilization. Uh, something else uh, Scott was saying in looking at archaeological excavations that uh, many of the ports in the Mediterranean were allowed to silt up. In other words, if you want to keep your port running, you're going to have to dredge it every now and again to keep the ships coming in and out. When that is gone, no one's, you, you obviously, you don't need to do that anymore, so the trade is gone. Okay, let's admit that I'm wrong. As the evidence is presented right now, I'm willing to argue that Perrin is probably right, that in fact the real loss of civilization, the real loss of Mediterranean civilization, was because of Rome. Because of Rome, I said that wrong. Because of the Muslims, which meant that the development or the continuation of civilization is now has to shift away from the Roman Empire to places like France. Germany, and Britain. And this is really the creation, shall we say, of medieval civilization. And civiliz medieval civilization comes into, evolves into modern civilization. And our next discussion, we will, we will proceed with that. In the meantime, I hope the weather's warm outside for you. Hope you're enjoying life. And we will speak to you again next time so I need to stop